to run a factory BIOS. And memory accesses, most of the memory accesses, I.O. accesses, MSR, uh, reads and writes, and CPU ID operations, they go over the serial port into the, the, um, or over to the ROM shell and are actually executed on the real hardware. The results are read back to QEMU and um, there's also uh, a Lua, uh, Lua interpreter included in Serialize, so you can do some scripting and filtering of, of all of these um, operations skip long loops and, and whatever you don't care about and maybe set some magic values that are necessary to get the ROM to continue. Uh, all of this can uh, also, thanks to the, the good debugging stuff in QEMU, you can also debug the factory BIOS using GDB. So that's really handy. And uh, there was a question last year about JTAG and, and ICE, um, uh, the in-circuit emulators, that you might be able to use uh, and that are common on embedded um, architectures, but it's not really, they're not really very affordable for uh, PCs. So this is a, not quite a replacement in every way, but it, it works in a lot of cases and it's very useful to understand what's going on inside the factory BIOS if you're stuck. Uh, many times the only op uh, alternative is to find out what, what the factory BIOS is doing. Same goes for the VGA BIOS, of course. CBIOS news, uh, it got adopted by QEMU, and QEMU are actually going to use CBIOS as their uh, default BIOS from version 0.12, I believe, and later on. CBIOS also has some USB keyboard support and um, just recently got ATA uh, DMA support. It runs option ROMs natively. You can have lots of them stuck uh, or tucked, tucked into CBFS. It will run through all of them and then it's uh, going to make or show a nice boot menu if you want to with all the devices found by these option ROMs or initialized by the option ROMs. So it's, it's, really, um, it's really very compatible to a BIOS. It does the exact same things. Just it's open source and um, uh, I think runs faster as we'll see in a bit. Uh, another nice thing with CBIOS is that if you put a few more payloads uh, into CBFS besides CBIOS, you can get to those payloads in the boot menu as well. And some more, some more stuff happened, uh, good stuff in libpayload. There was a GPL uh, licensed OHCI driver. Uh, so the existing USB support in libpayload is UHCI, the Intel and, and VIA controllers. Um, unfortunately, this was licensed under the GPL and uh, uh, some code from other GPL sources uh, was reused, so it, it really can't be changed by the author. Uh, since libpayload is BSD licensed, we can't really merge it, but we can keep the patch, of course, and um, uh, for anyone who is okay with having a GPL licensed libpayload, they can, they can use this driver and get USB support also on other hardware. Philo learned to do USB mass storage and uh, FlashROM had two releases. 090 in, um, in May with the, the works, just hundreds of flash chips and uh, chipset supported. And then 091 in September was, um, uh, came out. And that supports external flashing as well. So not only the, the boot flash connected all the way down there, but it also supports flashing flash chips on, um, on network adapters and on uh, the silicon image uh, serial ATA adapters. And it also supports FTDI, these, um, uh, some FTDI USB to SPI converters. Uh, it also specifies a universal external flasher protocol that is useful with a small microcontroller. And uh, one good feature introduced in, in 091 is that it will now always uh, verify when it has done write and erase operations. Previously, you had to do that manually, and, and yeah, it's, it's nice to do that uh, always. Finally, there's a new tool, another new tool, BIOS Extract. It combines and extends all the, the previous uh, BIOS decoders into a single tool. So, Previously there was AMI Deco and Phoenix Deco and Award Deco and now there's just BIOS Extract. Also it supports uh, some new AMI uh, 
BIOSes that uh, the AMI deco doesn't really doesn't really support. And I wanted to say something about this boot timing measurement stuff that is is getting more popular and um, showing up in marketing. Uh, there's really no standardization, so it would be nice to to have this. And I think uh, we could, of course, uh, start doing some kind of formalized uh, formalized specification for how to measure boot times. It's important to to really know what you're looking at or what the numbers are describing when you're looking at them because. Um, there are about 30 voltages in, in a PC, um, give, or, give or take a few, and these need to come up in a specified order, and it, that takes time. It might not take seconds, but it still takes time. And um, also, are you, uh, when you're measuring how fast the BIOS is, are you measuring from the first, very first instruction that the CPU fetches, or or you may be measuring after you have the, the, uh, the BIOS failover part uh, executed. And um, yeah, what, what is this number really, what does this m number really mean? So we had um, uh, the CBIOS developer, the main CBIOS developer, Kevin O'Connor, he, he did some optimizing of CBIOS. Uh, and he did some tests and time, time measurements. He has an EPI-CN board, it's a C7, uh, I think one gig CPU, and the CN700 chipset, it's a mini ITX board. Um, he's using Core Boot and uh, has a CBIOS payload in the flash chip, and then he put GRUB on a serial ATA uh, solid state drive. So in his case, 350 milliseconds were spent on what seemed to be power sequencing because there wasn't really any, any execution going on in the CPU as far as he could tell. Um, then 50 milliseconds waiting for the SM bus to initialize this green, green thing so that you can read the EEPROM from the DIMMs. 20 milliseconds to set up the DDR-ROM. Uh, 10 milliseconds for the core boot code that does the PCI bus and, and uh, device initialization. 200 milliseconds for running the VGA BIOS to get some graphics. Uh, of course, that's just a blob, so we can't really change it. We just have to have to live with it. And um, another 10 milliseconds in GRUB, and in total that made um, 750 milliseconds from him pressing the power button until Linux kernel was running. And, and I think that's really good. And it's also because of this power sequencing or whatever is going on that is not CPU execution, because that is such a big part of this number, it's, it's uh, getting difficult to do much better. And that's exciting, of course. <laughs> so, conclusion, um, this firmware stuff, I think it's an interesting problem. I mean, we have 30 years of, of hardware history in every PC out there, and we need to, we need to know how to rub it the right way. Uh, Kconfig makes it a lot easier to get started using Core Boot, um, even if you're only uh, playing with QEMU and you're running it uh, um, emulated. It's still it's still very easy to get going. A lot of mainboards have the same components and uh, are, are really similar. And this is a good way to get get started with the development to to find a mainboard which is similar to something already supported. Serialize is a, a great addition. It helps understand uh, what the factor bias does. As I said, the vendor documentation, if, even if we can get it, which we many times can't, it's never sufficient. We need to, to figure out what, what the other code is, is doing. And uh, so core boot on netbooks, what's, or laptops in general, what's the big deal, or, or what's, what's the status? So uh, via VX800 and the Nano is being used the combination is being used in a couple of modern netbooks, and I bought this uh, Samsung NC20 uh, machine, which I'm working on. Uh, so I'm, I guess hopefully for FOSDEM. Let's see. So thanks to Alexander Klink for help with the preparations and, and getting me uh, set up here, and all the chaos angles again for making this conference happen. Uh, it's <laughs>